Good morning, friends. Welcome back to A Real Live with Miss Cope. As you see, it's kind of a um, dreary morning, um, but that's okay because it's Tuesday and it's June 2nd and um, we are getting closer to the end of the school year. You all are working so hard and I really appreciate all your hard work. So we are reading It Ain't So Awful Falafel by Feruze Dumas. Um, the chapter we left off on is called, Please Ask Me About Camels Instead. And remember, um, Zamarad and Carolyn are on the hunt to find out who left the dead hamster at Zamarad's front door. My dad's daily routine, wake up, start arguing with my mom, look at the want ads for a job, ask me to address more envelopes, if there are any new ads, continue arguing with my mom, ask me to put stamps on the envelopes, ask me to put letters in the mailbox. I say a little prayer before I drop them in, go to bed, repeat the next day. The bickering usually starts because my mom tells my dad that he shouldn't listen to the radio so much. She is right, but my dad has nothing else to do. He says he wants to know the minute the hostages are released. On weekdays, the world news on TV doesn't come on until the evening but the radio has news all the time. That's why it's on all day. My dad hasn't heard back from any of the employers we've sent resumes to. Things were so much better before when no one knew where Iran was and everyone asked us if we rode camels. Next chapter, go Brock. During lunch on Monday, we look for Brock. We find him in his usual spot by the flagpole, surrounded by his jerky friends. Hey Brock, Carolyn yells, come here for a second. His friends stop talking and stare at us. Brock starts walking over. Come here, Brocky bro, one of the boys says in a high voice. We love you, Brock. Smoochy, smoochy, kissy, kissy, another one calls out. Brock ignores them. What is it? He asks when he reaches us. First of all, your friends are idiots. Second, the time has come for us to put the Linden's pantry plan into action. Meet us tonight in front of your house at 8 p.m. Okie dokie. He turns around and heads back to the flagpole. His friends start making loud kissing noises. It's a loser's convention, Carolyn says to me. Totally. That night, Carolyn and I go to Brock's. My parents wanted to know why we were going out so late, so I told them we had a science project about stars. It's not like telling the truth was an option. Brock is already waiting for us on his porch. Alone in the dark, he looks different from when he's surrounded by his posse of nin nitwits. Hey, he says. Hey, you ready, Carolyn asks. Brock nods, joins us in the driveway. We start walking towards Sydney's house. The darkness is interrupted by the glow of the street lamp. There's no one out but us. People seem to go to bed very early in my neighborhood. So Brock, what exactly are you going to say? Carolyn asks. Just chill and trust me. There's a method to my madness. You don't even know what that means, Carolyn laughs. Do too, Brock responds. It's from Hamlet. And I don't mean the chill part, although Shakespeare was definitely chill. There's no way you have read Hamlet, Carolyn insists. Didn't say I did. It's on my mom's coffee mug. Brock replies with a flip of the hair. No, to Shakespeare, you are very chill and I run too. Good to know. When we arrive at the Lindens, Carolyn and I hide behind the hedge near my house while Brock goes up and knocks on the door. I feel nervous and excited, but mostly nervous. I have only seen Car Sydney's parents in the pictures in their house, and now here I am spying on them. Cindy's mom opens the door and Brock says, Hello, Mrs. Linden. Let me first say how sorry I am about the, about the passing of J. Edgar Hoover. He was a fine hamster. How did you know he died, she asked, putting her hands on her hips. Carolyn and I look at each other. I knew we couldn't trust him. Carolyn whispers, he's an idiot. But Brock continues calmly. I assume the worst since you didn't call me after the chocolate tragedy. As soon as she hears the word tragedy, Mrs. Linden's expression softens. Oh, honey, you have no idea. It was the most painful thing, poor J. Edgar. Now, of course, Dottie is all alone in her cage. She's just sitting by the hamster wheel waiting. It's like Romeo and Juliet, but worse. This is just so darn sweet of you, Brock, Mrs. Linden says. How about tomorrow after school? Cindy will be at the stables and I have a hair appointment. 
deal, Brock says with a grin. Maybe his brain isn't so waterlogged after all, Carolyn whispers. We sneak around the back of my house and meet Brock on the sidewalk in front of the Kleins where Mrs. Linden won't see us. He holds up his hand triumphantly and Carolyn and I both give him a high five. I have a full report for you on Wednesday morning at school. Mr. Holmes, he says to Carolyn. Then he turns to me and I'll see you in the library Wednesday at lunch, Watson. I have a math test on Friday. So Brock got the key into the Linden's home so he can snoop around in the pantry to solve the mystery of the dead hamster on the front porch. Next chapter, Cowboys and Ironians. On my walk to school the next morning, I see a car with a bumper sticker that says, Iranians go home. I read it twice because I'm sure I must be wrong. I have never seen such a thing. I want to see what the driver looks like. What kind of person puts such a hateful bumper sticker on his car? Two minutes later, I see, on the, see one that says, I play cowboys and Iranians. My heart starts racing. What is going on? Is this allowed in America? Freedom of speech. Where are all of these anti-Iranian bumper stickers coming from? I asked Mrs. Williams as I'm studying at Carolyn's that afternoon. Mrs. Williams is reading the newspaper at the dining room table while we do our math. Some people are just out to make a buck and this is a horrible way to do it. Try not to take it personally, she replies looking up from the paper. It's hard, I admit. Believe me, the day after the last day of the world, there will be no one selling bumper stickers that say one survived the last day of the world. I survived the last day of the world. Mrs. William tells me people will put anything on a bumper sticker if they think someone will buy it. I just hope the hostages are freed soon, I sigh. I don't like everyone hating Iranians. Not everyone hates Iranians, she assures me, putting down the paper. People who hate just happen to be the loudest. That's so true. Next chapter. If only you, your accent were French or English or anything else. My dad still has not gotten any responses to the resume he sent out. His, he telephoned a bunch of the companies to follow up and they all said, don't call us, we'll call you. I don't think anyone is going to hire him. Who in the US is going to hire an Iranian now, especially one with a thick accent? I can say, Never say this to him, though. I don't think he gets how bad it is. Dr. Klein came over last week and asked my dad if there was anything he could do to help him find a job. My dad gave him five copies of his resume. The next chapter, Brock Rocks. I can infer that it was a success with Brock. Wednesday morning, before the bell rings, Brock comes looking for us. So I went to Mrs. Linden's yesterday and guess what? She has the stuff on your list. It's all in her pantry. Before we could say anything, he continues. Hey, Cindy, instead of math, can you help me with my essay on of mice and men? I haven't finished the book yet. There aren't a lot of mice in it so far. Sure, I say, glancing sideways at Carolyn. Stupendous. I'll see you at the library at lunch, he says. This is your fault, I whisper to Carolyn as Brock returns around to, turns around to leave. I know, she replies, smiling as she hurries away from her homeroom. She, so Darlene Linden is the culprit. It's hard to wrap my mind around this. How could an adult do something like that? Though her behavior explains a lot about original Sydney. I'm unsure what to do next. During our next class together, I tell Carolyn I have to think about it for a few days. At lunchtime, Brock is already in the library. When I arrive, for some reason, I'm really nervous. I rub my sweaty palms on my pants. Hi, Brock. I sit down across from him. Hey, thanks a lot for writing my essay. Wait a second. I didn't say that I would write your essay. I'm going to help you. When is it due? Friday. Finish the book today and I'll come to your house tomorrow after school. I'm not writing your essay for you. Whatever, he says, looking disappointed. And let me give you one hint. It's not another m mice. It's not about mice. <laughs> I was beginning to think so. It is a metaphor. Or is it a metaphor? He asks. I'm stunned. You know what that means? Yeah. I'm not sure if I should say what I'm thinking. I decided to go for it. You know something? You're so... You are so much smarter than you act. 
Brock just stares at me with a funny look on his face. He doesn't say anything. I gotta go. I mumbled. I pushed my chair away from the table and hurry out of the library. I shouldn't have said that. Next chapter of Mice and Men and Metaphors. Fifth graders know what metaphors are. We just ended our poetry unit. They are rock star poets now. The first thing that pops into my head when I wake up the next morning is that I'm going to Brock's after school. I have butterflies in my stomach. Maybe it's because this is the first time I'm going to a boy's house, house alone. I'm not telling my parents. There's no way they would let me go. I come home after school, drop off my stuff, and tell my mom I'm going for a bike ride. Good, she says. I'll ma it'll make you taller. Whatever. I ride to Brock's, which takes less than three minutes. I lean my bike next to his gate and ring the doorbell. Skip answers. Hi there, Cindy, he says enthusiastically. I hear you're helping the Brock Meister with his essay. That's awfully nice of you. Sure thing. I don't mention that I'm going th doing this because Brock helped us solve the mystery of the dead hamster. Skip leads me to the dining room. The first thing I see is a huge clock in the shape of a boat helm on the wall. On either side, there is an oar, just as I notice the huge marlin on another wall. Skip yells, Brock, your teacher's here. I blush. Brock comes down the stairs. Hey, Cindy. Hey, I'm going to leave you two to work here in the dining room, Skip announces. Cindy, let me know if you want something to drink. He turns around to leave and stops. You know, if someone had told me that Brock would have such a smart friend, I would have said, that'll happen when pigs fly. I guess pigs are flying now. He laughs as he leaves the room. My dad's so weird, whispered Brock. He calls all my friends blockheads. So how come your dad's home at this time of day? I asked, wondering if Skip has also lost a job. He owns the golf shop at a fashion island. Bye bye, Birdie. So he's home a lot. You're lucky. Brock shrugs. Okay, let's get started. Did you finish the book? Yep. What do you think? Most depressing book ever. <laughs> Kinda. I had to go surfing this morning to get it out of my system. You went surfing this morning before school? Yeah, best time to go. What do you mean? To get it out of my system. You just get on a wave. Sadness goes away, I mean. You can't be sad and surfing at the same time. You just want to hold on to that, but you can't. You got to keep going back. I pause for a moment, thinking of sailing at Camp White's Landing. It seems like she's long ago now. I know exactly what you mean. We sit in awkward silence. There are sides to Brock that are just as hidden as his eyes. Okay, now the essay. I say trying to change the mood. Which essay question did you choose to write about? I picked the metaphor theme. I went with how Steinbeck uses the dead mouse and the dead puppy as a metaphor for George and Lenny's dreams dying. Wow, that's great. I hadn't even thought of that myself. So what do you need help with? I don't know, I guess. I just want wanted to run this by you, you being a brainiac and all. He hands me a piece of paper with neat writing covering both sides. I read his essay. It's really good. I wouldn't change a thing. You're smarter than you think, Brock. I mean, you picked a harder essay question than I did. I don't know. It's true. You just hang out with a crowd that thinks being smart is not cool. So, I should hang out with you and Carolyn, he asked, smiling. I can't tell if he's joking. Yeah, you should. As soon as the word's out of my mouth, I think I shouldn't have said them. Why does this keep happening to me when I talk to Brock? I gotta go. I stand up quickly. Thanks, Sydney, he says, following me to the entryway. I open the door. Before I leave, I pause. I didn't even help you. Your essay's really good, I say without looking back. I need to avoid another awkward moment. There have already been too many. I walk my bike back home, so I have a few extra minutes to think. If Steinbeck's dead animals are a metaphor for dead dreams, what is the meaning of the dead hamster in my life? Interesting. So Zamarod is getting to know Brock a little more. I guess there's more to Brock than just what's on the surface and Cindy's figuring that out. Or Zamarod's figuring that out. All right, we're ending it there. Thank you for watching as always, friends. I hope you enjoy your day. I will see you tomorrow.
tomorrow I'm also packing up my classroom. Um, I'll be moving next year, which is super cool. But till then, toodles.